What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Nicey Chung of Benny. I'm here with my co-host, Greg King. What's good, everybody? And you're listening to the Ball Fake Podcast. Welcome back to another episode. This is now episode 32. If you're watching on YouTube or you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure you guys give us a nice review. Comment hashtag let's go viral and make sure you guys like and subscribe, turn on our post notifications and share our episodes and podcast videos with all your friends and everything. But today, you know, we got a special episode for you guys. We're going to talk about the national championship game, what we thought Gonzaga needed to do in order to come out with a win and what we thought Bailey did a phenomenal job of helping them come out with the W. But before we do all that, we're going to hop, uh, give a quick shout out to our subscriber today, which is Ryan Espino. Appreciate you liking and subscribing and turning on all of our post notifications. Oh, post notification. But uh Greg, I mean, last night we had a we had a thriller. Yeah. Psych. Um, <laughs> Baylor <laughs> Baylor came in, they punched him in the mouth to start oh, the game. God. I mean, they started the game on a 16-4 run. Uh yeah. Mitchell and Butler, they got it going pretty early. And they also got some help from, you know, their uh, supporting cast role players. Macy Oteague, he had a phenomenal game, finished with 19. Um Flagler, he he hit some timely threes. And I thought Flo Thamba and um Ch- Chachua, how you say it, I think it is. Yeah, they had a phenomenal game on the defensive end and on the offensive rebound. Which was much needed because Timmy and Kispert are deadly in the front court. So right, right. Putting pressure on them definitely slowed Gonzaga down, and I think that was a difference maker. Right, and you know, Baylor, like I said, I mean, they started the game rolling on the offensive end. You know, they made 6 of 15 um, other two-pointers, 4 for 4 from three-point range. You know, this is a team, they one of the best three-point shooting teams in the nation. And given the fact that, you know, Gonzaga struggled shooting the three ball beyond the yard this entire postseason, I knew that was going to be one of the key difference makers in who wins this entire game. But, you know, I thought Gonzaga, they definitely looked sped up. Um, this was no surprise. I mean, Baylor, they have one of the best defense in, defenses in the nation. Um, their perimeter defense is second to none. I mean, yeah. Davian Mitchell, Jared Butler, like I said, Macy O.T., those guys, they, they, they get up get into you. They, have, they make multiple efforts. And, you know, they just do everything that you want your players to do, veteran guards to do on the defensive end to make sure that, you know, they're not giving up any open shots and making sure the off opposing team isn't comfortable offensively. But yeah. what were some things that you thought that, you know, Gonzaga should have did better last night in order for them to have a better shot at winning? Play, play, at, your sti- play at your style. I mean, do what you've been doing all year. Have I mean, it sucks that Jalen Suggs got in foul trouble. I think that that – that messed them up a lot but getting in pick and rolls getting getting timmy and Corey kisper some looks on the outside to get them going and that would have helped a lot but when they when you got mitchell and teague and those guys getting up in Jalen suggs face and he couldn't really create the offense like they wanted to and hit them him turn the ball over um they had 14 turnovers and they allowed um baylor to have 19 points off of turnovers that was a season high and um just getting, just getting bullied inside. I, I thought Timmy looked kind of weak. Kisper looked weak. They just did not look. They did not look like themselves, and I was very surprised by that because I really thought Gonzaga was going to come out and really match that intensity, especially after the game with UCLA, which is very tough. But one thing that I did have to note: Gonzaga, these guys, they play well throughout the year, but they don't see competition all year. And I think that's the problem coming into a tournament like this in the single elimination. I think I got to tip my hat ball to screw Scott Drew, who just prepared his team. Got them ready. Got they're all disciplined, great kids. Assignment sound. I mean, anytime they need to rotate, they got got into the face. Make sure Jalen Suggs got in foul trouble. Make sure that Kisper couldn't get going. Make sure Timmy can got like they did everything right. They played a perfect game. They were shooting at one point like 50% from the field, 60% from the three-point line. I mean, just kicking their ass. It yeah. was crazy. Yep. But I cannot believe that Baylor just played like this and we just saw a blowout. But one thing I want to bring up about Gonzaga, they need to switch conferences. And we can switch over to this and what you think about this nicely. But I think they need to switch conferences. Join the Pac-12. Join a conference that can get you some competition throughout the year because you got to prepare for a tournament like this. They're, Gonzaga and Mark Few are 0-8 against number one seeds in the tournament. Like that is, that is disappointing. Interesting stat. Yeah, interesting stat, for real. So what do they need to change going forward? Um, I mean, as far as their program, I think their program, it, it, it's second to none. I mean, they've been dominant in their conference for years to come. Um, like we stated earlier in the in the beginning of our podcast, we told you guys that, you know, Mark Few, he could lose his next 46 to 48 games and still have the highest winning percentage in college basketball. And that's had that, you know, 
that says a lot about that program and everything. But I also think it says a little bit about the conference and the competition that they play on a nightly basis. Now, we all know this Gonzaga Bulldogs team. They're a phenomenal team offensively, very efficient. One of the most efficient college basketball offenses we've seen. But it kind of is a little bit dis... Um, what's it called? It, it, it's kind of misleading just because, like... I won't, I won't say that, you know, the competition is terrible, but Gonzaga is not going to be tested too many times in a regular season, and it tends to hurt them in the postseason for years to come now. And I think, you know, going back to what you said, Greg, they definitely need to move to a different conference. I, I would be all for for them moving to the Pac-12, you know, facing teams like UCLA, USC, maybe Washington State, you know, teams like that, that can, you know, really give them a test earlier in the season that way it doesn't hurt them in the postseason and everything but i mean just going back to this game overall um when jalen Suggs picked up those two quick early fouls I, th I thought that i knew for a fact that that was going to hurt gonzaga's offense overall and they were going to have to rely heavily on drew timmy's offense um and everything but like i said i mean outside of Suggs. Overall, that entire night, Gonzaga didn't have much production on the offensive end. You know, I mean, Kispert, he finished with 12 points. He was very inefficient, couldn't hit a grape in the ocean. Drew Timmy, he was held to 12 points. Um, Ayayi, this is somebody who's coming off a historic game. He finished 20, 22 points against UCLA. He was one of the main guys that kept him in that game. And then he comes in, into this national championship game. He lays an egg. He can't get going. Yeah. And then, I mean, Nemhart, he, he only pours in nine points. And it wasn't, you know, a very effective nine points. They were kind of very ugly. And, you know, it just wasn't all that efficient and all that beneficial. Yeah. They weren't very timely or anything. So, I mean... The only guy that showed up was Suggs. I mean, right. which we and expect. I mean, even even Suggs, he didn't really get it going until late, late. in the second half. I which mean, by then it was too late. Right. I mean, he only had seven points in the first half. He finishes the game with 22, 3, and 1. Um, if you look at the box score, you would think, man, this kid had a you know performance for the ages, for a freshman at least. Yeah. But it, it wasn't exactly that type of story, man. And I think it was really shocking for a team like Gonzaga, who averages 91 points per game, to come out and finish with only 70 points per game. Given the fact that, you know, like I said, this is one of the best offensives, not only this year, but, you know, all time. They're, they, they're very efficient from three, very efficient from two-point range. I mean, they knock down their free throws, shoot like sub-70% and everything. And, you know, overall, they, they're just offense is just cut to a crisp um, for the most part. But, you know, like I said, I mean, we have a – this is a big testament to Baylor's perimeter defense. Yeah. Like I said, Macy O.T., Davian Mitchell, Jared Butler, you know, they forced a ton of turnovers last night, like you stated. And, I mean, they really pushed Gonzaga's offense very deep. You yeah. know, they were playing 35 feet out. They looked uncomfortable the entire night. And, overall, I mean, this just came out to, you know, really hurt them in, in the um, – entire game yeah i mean they kept they kept them on the perimeter most of the game i mean they did not touch the paint like that at all i mean if they did it was a missed assignment or a transition off a of steal like it was rare lot barely any transition points it was crazy but it was a good game overall for baylor i'm happy for baylor scott drew who was hired in 2003 finally got that championship that he promised i love that press conference that they showed a flashback that was great and just the way he carried those guys all season through the COVID protocols and everything like that, it was they well deserved, well deserved. To cap it off like that it was well deserved. And what do you think about Davion Mitchell? Do you think he improved his draft stock? Because I saw earlier in the year he had like he was like a late first round. Now they're saying Jay Bills is kind of saying he's like 15 through 20. So what do you think about him? I mean, absolutely. I yeah. mean, that, that, he's somebody that you know he's got an NBA build already pretty decent offensive game and you know where the nba is headed this is a shooters league and yeah. he's definitely showcased that he can knock down three balls stretch it out for you and you know be a tenacious defender on the opposing end so yeah i definitely think that's a guy who's definitely risen his draft stock jared butler probably has yeah. as well but um you know overall i think davion mitchell he, he he could easily be a mid first rounder just because we this draft it kind of somewhat has a few names but a lot of these guys draft stock dropped yeah um, after you know what happened in the regular season and everything josh christopher is a guy who his draft stock has dropped bj boston he declared for the draft he 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 will probably still end up going mid first round but he definitely needs some lottery. development but you know overall i mean i think davion mitchell for sure pushed himself ahead of the curve yeah compared to the rest of these guards in the country i definitely agree and just to finish off our last point what do you think about jalen suggs and his performance this whole year throughout the tournament and how he will transition to the nba 
Uh, I really love Jalen Suggs as yeah. an athlete, man. I mean, two sport athlete. Any guy who's playing basketball, I encourage you to go out and play football, man. That that toughness and you know that grit and everything that you have to play with on that football field, I think it really benefited Jalen Suggs on the basketball court. You know, he was somebody. He he showcased his athleticism. You know, he he was able to not come into the lane and not get bumped over and everything. He's, he's got good size and everything. But yeah, I mean, Suggs overall in the season, I mean, he had a pretty great season. Um, especially for somebody you know who's going to a storied program where you know they're trying to push for a national championship and you nearly get to the um a, a, achieve that especially on the way making a historic shot with that 35 footer the previous game yeah but i mean Suggs, he's he's a great he's a great athlete he's great a great leader. person great leader and he's definitely a top three lock in this nba draft yeah but guys, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Ball Fake Podcast. We greatly appreciate it. We know we've been on and off with our episodes. We're sorry. Um, we're going to try to be better in the future and everything. But uh, yeah, make sure you guys like and subscribe if you're on YouTube. Share with a friend. Turn on post notifications. Make sure, help us get to 5,000 subscribers by the end of this year. We know we can do it. We got six months to do it. So make sure you guys hit that big red button and support our channel and everything. But, you know, outside of that, it's your boy, Nicey Chunga Benny. I'm here with my co-host, Greg King. And we out. We out.